Okay, welcome to the uh, online causal inference seminar. Uh, today we are excited to have uh, Panos Toulis from Chicago Booth, who will talk about randomization tests for spillovers under general interference, a graph theoretic approach. Um, so this is a joint work with several collaborators, uh, two of which are also with us today, David and Guillaume, who are happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have uh, in, uh, in Q&A. Uh, Panos will also uh, stop from time to time to uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, after the talk, uh, we will have a discussion by Pong Ding, and then after that, Panos uh, can, uh, can respond uh, if, we, if, he, if he wants. All right, uh, that's it from my side. Uh, questions are handled by Guillaume, so I'm switching over to him now. All right, thanks. So a uh, quick amendment to what Dominic is, uh, uh, said. Uh, David will handle the Q&A, and I will watch him do. Uh, so um, as usual, uh, if you have questions for Panos, please ask them via the Q&A. Um, we will stop occasionally and ask him the questions. Um, if you if, if your question is selected, I will ask you to raise your hand. Uh, there's a there's a, a button for that. Uh, so please don't raise your hand until I've I've asked you to do so. Um, all right. So that's pretty much it for the for the Q and A. Uh, Panos, uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Hello. Uh, you can see my screen. Yep. Looks yep. Good. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, appreciate the, the invite. Thank you for the invite, and thanks for more generally for for doing this. It's it's one of uh, let's say bright things. The very few good things about this these times. Uh, so thanks for taking care of the the, the seminar. Uh, so as 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 uh, Dominic said, this is work joint work with uh, David Peltz. He's a postdoc at uh, Chicago Booth. He'll be in the in the market next year. Uh, and also Avi Feller at Berkeley and Guillaume Bass at, at Stanford. Um, and uh, this is about randomization tests for spillovers under interference. And um, this, uh, I'll, I'll start with some uh, basic definitions first, and then we're going to set up the notation, set up the problem like more concretely. So the, the general definition of interference is that interference is when we have interference when the outcomes of the unit, some unit, doesn't have to be all the units, um, depends on the treatment of others. And there's a, a very um, kind of, uh, there's a lot of literature in that kind of from, from different angles, uh, statistics, econometrics, uh, computer science, uh, kind of trying to look into this problem because it becomes more and more um, uh, interesting because there's rarely any uh, settings uh, where interference does not exist, right? Like humans are connected, they interact with each other, so they do affect each other. Uh, Interference is a general ter term, like an umbrella term. So there are other names for it can be, or at least it includes things like spillover, spear effects, contagion, if there's time, time dependence, equilibrium effects. Um, uh, and as I said, these are pre pervasive in most uh, social studies. Now, it either can be a nuisance where then the, the idea is to try to address it with design, for instance, um, in, in agricultural experiments, there might be nuisance between two different, two different agricultural fields uh, and you might kind of separate, it, separate them. Now, uh, in, in other cases, it might be the quantity of interest, right? We might care about how people interact with each other, how they affect each other. Uh, we might care about the unintended consequences of a policy, for instance. Now, the motivation for this work um, is um, uh, crime spillovers. So um, there was a policing experiment, like a very large policing experiment that happened in the city of Medellin, Colombia. Uh, and um, this is going to motivate my work, uh, that, sorry, my, my, my talk today, and um, it's going to motivate the method that I'm going to present. Um, I'm com I'm, I will come back to that um, during, during the talk. Um, for interference, there are several approaches. Uh, it's, uh, usually it's either model-based or, or design-based. Uh, model-based approaches include regressions, let's say like linear regressions where you regress unit outcomes on, on treatment of others, like a, like a group treatment or like the peer treatments, or even the outcomes of others. Um, however, uh, it's, it's a hotly debated issue, uh, especially in econometrics, because there had, it has been noted that this kind of regressions are like, you know, they, they, you have to proceed with caution um, because uh, there are identification issues. Um, and also even, even, even if the model is identified, it's, it's kind of hard to interpret. 
um, in the sense that there might be uh, there might be some completely non-social effect that might you know could show up it could manifest as a, as a, as a social effect as a peer effect. Uh, so this point is is well made now. So um, it, there's there's always a lot of caution that has to be uh, when we when we apply these model-based approaches. Uh, on the other side, the design-based approaches have emerged as as a robust alternative because we don't have to trust a particular model. Uh, the, the kind of hypothesis that we test is very, very precise. Um, even though it's limited, it, it's very precise and the method is, is, is valid regardless. And most of the methods try to generalize the, the classical feature randomization test, uh, which I'm going to, to describe soon. Um, and as I said, uh, and that's a point also that I'm going to, to, to come back at soon, the, the benefits of these design-based approaches, randomization-based approaches, is finite sample validity, um, the fact that we don't need approximations, we don't need a normality assumptions or anything of that sort, or like a, a well-specified model. So that's why these methods are, are usually um, robust. So um, what's the outline today? I'm going to set up the notation very briefly. Uh, I will talk about the classical uh, feature randomization test, which is going to be the template uh, method that I would like to generalize and extend to cases with interference. And then we'll just jump right into the, the setting where we have interference. And we'll talk about the, what kind of hypotheses are of interest there. Uh, we'll talk about the, what is the challenge with the classical Fisher test? Why can we not apply the classical uh, methods in this case? And, and what are some recent approaches to try to address that? And what is, you know, what is our contribution? Um, which mainly is comprised by this uh, conceptual, if you will, device of the, the so-called null exposure graph. And given that, that device, then we can use it to define a specific version of a, a Fischerian randomization test. Um, throughout, I'm going to talk about the application in Medellin, but keep in mind that um, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk about in detail about the particular application, um, mainly because uh, it kind of talking about this, you know, the, the policing and the, and the spillovers of crime requires a lot of background in criminology and sociology, which uh, which I don't have, uh, so I'm going to focus mostly on what what the problem is and what kind of questions can you can you can you answer through our method. So I will focus more on what the, our method can can provide, and less on the particular substantive, let's say, uh, scientific question. Now, uh, if we have time, we can discuss uh, some considerations about what I what I'm going to present, especially computation time uh, and and the power of the tests which is always an uh, um, um, unknown or like a, a, a big question when we apply randomization tests. Okay, so let me jump to the, to the setup. It's pretty minimal for now. Uh, I'm going to assume a fixed set of units. Uh, so this U is going to be the, the entire universe of the units, one, two, two, N, this is fixed. And I'm going to use little i to index these units. Uh, the treatment, the population treatment is going to be a vector of um, n binaries. So Z1 is the treatment of unit 1, Z2 is the treatment of unit 2, Zn is the treatment of unit n. Uh, and I'm going to use this uh, bold uh, C uh, in order to, not, to denote the, the entire universe, which in this case is a hypercube, but it doesn't have to be. So uh, I'm assuming binary treatment, but this is without loss of generality. It's, it's mostly for simplicity. Uh, then YZ is the potential outcomes uh, under this under some assignment Z uh, following the standard notation. So this is the potential outcome of unit one under population assignment Z and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to assume we have scalar, scalar outcomes for now. Um, I will use subscri uh, superscript uh, OBS just to emphasize the observed quantities. Uh, and then this stars in order to uh, indicate randomization draw. So in the randomization test, we're going to resample the treatment assignments I'm going to use this star notation in the kind of sim the similar vein that uh, you do it in, in, in Bootstrap. Um, and then P of Z is, the, is going to be the design. So basically it's a probability distribution over the assignment space. Um, and it gives me um, the kind of describes how the experiment was done. And cr crucially, it's going to be assumed known. So I have, so the, I'm going to assume there's an experiment and I do have access to that, to, to the design. So, I'm going to follow the standard framework of um, randomization inference, randomization uh, tests, where uh, the potential outcomes are, are, are assumed to be fixed and all the randomness comes from the, from the design, comes from this uh, distribution PMC. Okay, uh, so fairly standard, very simple uh, notation so far. 
Um, what are some questions of interest? Um, now, I'm going to describe a couple of them. There's a, a, a lot of them that have been, um, you know, uh, considered in the literature, and of course, it changes with the application. But here are some that that are kind of more or less well known uh, in the literature. Uh, some of them uh, are known in the in the, in the setting of no interference, but we're going to uh, make them into a testable assumption, uh, in testable hypothesis, uh, namely for the, the so-called sort of assumption. So let's start with the simplest one. So the simplest one is the no Triton effect, right? Like the global null where we say that, um, uh, basically we're saying that the Triton has no effect. So how can we write this down using my notation? Well, we can say uh, that the outcomes are the same for every unit I, uh, regardless of, this, of the specific Triton assignment. Okay, so um, some, as I said, sometimes they call it like the global null or the no treatment effect whatsoever. So basically this is telling us that nothing is happening. The treatment has no effect. Okay, that's the simplest, the strongest uh, null that we can test in some, some sense. Uh, another assumption is the no interference assumption, which basically is saying that um, the outcomes of the units are the same when uh, the treatment, the individual treatment of the units um, stays fixed. So for any, for any population treatments like Z and Z prime, so remember that recall this Z is, is a, a NAN length vector, like it, it has all the, the treatments of all the units. Um, so um, here we're saying that this entire vector does not matter for the outcome of that unit if the, the individual treatment of that unit is the same for Z and Z prime. Um, this is known, I'm kind of setting this up as an null hypothesis, but this is known as the Sattva assumption, right? The stable unit treatment value assumption uh, in classical uh, causal inference where it basically leads to this notation of two potential outcomes, right? Like that we are uh, familiar with, like the YI0, YI1, because by this assumption, there are only two uh, possible outcomes. So now, as you can see, now we're going to make this into a testable assumption, uh, uh, similar in, 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 in spirit uh, with um, uh, how they did it in like, uh, like Susan Ethy, Dean Eccles, and uh, Guido Ibens in their paper uh, discussing interference, they discussed a, a long list of assumptions, that's, that's, that was one of them. And they kind of made this, they made it into a, an, a testable assumption and we're going to consider it uh, soon in, in the same, same vein. Um, another uh, hypothesis we'd like to test, for instance, is, you know, suppose the units are in a social network, let's say family network or like friendship network, uh, and we'd like to test whether there's only neighborhood interference. Uh, in this case, um, what we'd like to test is, again, a hypothesis where the, which we say that if you control for the individual treatments and the neighbor, your immediate neighbor's treatments, then uh, your outcomes are the same. I'm using this subscript here to kind of um, take the sub vector that, that corresponds to the neighbors of I. Okay, I'm, a, I'm being a little liberal, liberal with my notation, but uh, just in this for, 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 for the sake of simplicity. Uh, so basically here again, we're saying that uh, for any two population vector assignments, the, the entire vectors do not, do not matter if we fix, if you control for the individual treatments and the neighborhood treatment. Um, and um, uh, this, in some sense, this is testing for neighborhood interference because um, uh, it tells you that you know it's, it's uh, all the all the the effect of the treatment is being, let's say, in some sense, mediated by the by the neighborhood. Okay, now here is our meta in application. Um, uh, what kind of hypothesis do we have there? Well, in our application, is the situation is a little bit complicated. We have this city where we have this every green uh, gray dot here is the street, uh, is a street segment. Um, these red spots are what the officials identified as the hotspots for for policing, like the the streets that were eligible to be to receive uh, the treatment. Where in this case the treatment was uh, more more policing, and then the blue here are the treated units, like the treated streets. So I here is a hotspot street. Zi is um, the policing level uh, at, at street I, at unit I. So it's, it, it can be, bin it's, it's, it was binary essentially. Like if it was one, then it meant that that particular street got five minutes more of policing uh, per day than, than the other, than the non-treated um, units. And then the outcome was a crime score, like an aggregate of some uh, crime outcomes of, of interest. So in this case, uh, what we're going to test uh, later uh, is we're going to test for spillovers, uh, particularly though for control streets. 
So we're going to look for, uh, we're going to set up a hypothesis where we're going to say that uh, the outcome for a control street is the same regardless of whether neighboring streets are being treated or not. Uh, I'm going to set up the hypothesis very soon. In order to set it up, we will need a little more, more, more notation. Um, so for now, I just want to build the intuition and like the, what, what we're, we're aiming at. Okay, now, as you can see, these are all of these are different hypotheses. They might sound a little bit complicated. Um, one, one way to uh, kind of make these definitions a little more compact, um, make them a little more intuitive uh, has emerged. That's, um, um, that's called the, the concept of treatment exposures, uh, mainly proposed in the work by, by, by Peter Arno. Um, so the idea of the exposure is, is kind of straightforward. It tells you that you know, since we don't really expect that the entire population vector affects a unit, uh, maybe I can just project it into this, the entire population uh, assignment, kind of project it into a subspace, like a more limited, uh, a, not subspace, but a smaller space uh, where uh, the, the different values kind of make more intuitive sense. Um, so formally, think of if for every unit i think of a function that takes the population uh, assignment and then maps it into a well-defined set of different exposures so what do we mean by exposures well suppose that in the previous example where we had the neighborhood interference the, the neighborhood uh, interference right like the neighborhood test uh, suppose um, we define the exposure as your your treatment like the pair of your treatment and the number of treated neighbors let's say okay uh, so and this is a pair, so the, and this could be zero, one, it will take value zero, two, zero, three, one, zero, one, 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 two. So it's, it's up to the analyst, to the, to the scientists to define this, this exposures. We're not making any assumptions yet. All we're saying is we can use this function to basically um, represent, kind of reduce the dimensionality of the treatment assignment and then represent the aggregate effect of the treatment or the population treatment on a particular unit. Okay, so how can I use this to make these definitions of the, of the null hypothesis more compact? Well, here's one class of hypothesis I can test. Suppose this script F is a subset of this, of all those possible exposures that I can have, then I'm going to um, posit the hypothesis that my outcomes are the same if the exposures for Z and Z prime uh, are in this set, okay? My outcomes for Z and Z prime are the same, like for any pair Z and Z prime, um, uh, if my exposures are kind of remain in that set. So in some sense, I, I take a subset of these exposures and I'm, and I'm saying that these are equivalent uh, in terms of the outcomes in the, within this, this set, okay? So in order to see that, you know, how useful this can be, um, think about this special case where we just say that uh, this script F is actually the entire set of exposures. Well, in this case, this is equivalent to the, to the global null that I described earlier, right? Like basically it says that there's no effect from the treatment. Now, suppose this set is comprised by two different exposures. In some sense, this is a contrast hypothesis. I'm going to contrast between one exposure and another exposure. I want to see whether there's a, some differential effect between the two. And this is going to be our Medellin example that I'm going to discuss later. It's a special case where this set is, has only two elements. Uh, finally, I can make a little more complex operations. I can just take the intersection of, of hypothesis like this with singleton, uh, with a singleton set. And if I take it over the entire exposure set, Essentially, I get a hypothesis that's quite, uh, let's say, quite popular, or uh, it can describe many hypotheses in the interference literature. Basically, in some, it, it describes a, a kind of exclusion restriction, if you will. It tells you that the outcomes for ZZ prime are the same if your exposures are, are the same. Uh, and you can see now by different definitions of these exposures, we can get all the previous hypotheses, right? Like if this exposure is only ZI, for instance, if you take the population vector and you only take the ith element, uh, then this becomes sutva. If FIZ is the, you only take your treatment and the neighborhood treatment, then that becomes the neighborhood interference. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, this, uh, just to summarize this exposures, this, this idea of, of treatment exposures, I'm using it only to make these definitions more compact. Um, one downside of this, this, um, uh, of this, um, uh, of this approach, of, of this notation is that these Fs are not unique. Right, so you can have, um, you can define this exposure in a different way and you can still map to the same scientific problem, right? For instance, suppose this F is 
kind of add a constant, right? Or like a, make a momentum transformation. You still get the same null hypothesis. So it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, uh, but in order to have a unique, let's say, definition, um, it will require some more abstract uh, notation that it's, it will not be worth, uh, you know, the, the trouble. Um, for now, we're going to stick with this uh, concept, with this notation, and we're going to understand that this f, we're not making an assumption about the exposure, but we're only introducing it because we believe that all the interference questions can be solved in this f space rather than this, this bigger uh, z space. Okay. All right. So, but let's go back. Let's start from the from the beginning. Let's start from the simple um, global null hypothesis and see how we can now uh, do statistics. Right? How can we test this uh, this null hypothesis? Um, and now it's time to talk about the Fisher randomization test. One of the you know the you know for me like one of the most say uh, um, ingenious ideas, if you will, in statistics, um, just because of how simple it is and how 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 um, how precise and honest it is in the, the kind of question that it's, it's trying to solve. So suppose we're trying to solve the, the global null, right? Like we're saying that the outcomes are the same for any treatment assignment. Um, then um, here's how the, the Fisher test works. Uh, you choose a test statistic, uh, which is a function of the outcomes in the in the treatments. Um, I'm I'm calculating the observed value, which is my T obs. Uh, and then the second step, I start resampling. Okay, so this is Z star is uh, uh, the notation for the, the randomization draws. So I'm kind of drawing from my design um, because I'm assuming this is known. And for every um, assignment that I draw from my design and I'm simulate from my design, uh, I calculate the test statistic using the observed outcomes. Okay, and kind of store those values and kind of build this randomization distribution. And then I can calculate the p-value using the randomization distribution and what I observe. Okay, that's that's it. Um, so why is this valid? The proof is is pretty simple. What we have to really show is that whatever we observe, like the the actual sampling distribution, is the same as the randomization distribution. So these things are the same. So how can you do this? We can start with this definition here, the randomization test statistic. Um, um, uh, by the null hypothesis, this I can kind of replace these y obs with the y star. So basically, the, what this is saying is that you, under the null hypothesis, you know what the outcomes will be under z star. Okay, so this will be exactly equal to y obs, just because of how strong this hypothesis is. Based on my hypothesis, is that all the outcomes are the same, regardless of the assignment. Okay, so I make this first first substitution, and then um, just because I'm sampling this Z star from the design, this joint distribution is exactly equal to that, to the, to the sampling distribution, right? To the actual distribution of the test statistic. So basically with these two equations, we established that TR is equal to T of. So the normalization distribution is the same as the, the actual like the sampling distribution. So under the null. So that's why this, this test is valid. Um, the surprising thing here and the, you know, why, why people like the, 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 this randomization test uh, is that um, is is exact, right? I, I I make no no assumptions about the, the the size of the of the of the of the sample. I'm not making approximations or like asymptotics. Um, I'm not assuming any model for for the outcomes. Uh, this test statistic that I mentioned before is is you know it, it does not affect the how you choose it does not affect the validity. Um, you still you still have to use a good test statistic so that the, the null and the alternative are, are separated so you have more power, but uh, you don't need the model to be spec well specified to have, um, to have uh, validity. And finally, it's also robust, right? Like um, even when you transform the outcomes, uh, you know, kind of on different scale, some uh, monotone transformations, the, 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 the answer from, it from the randomization test is the same. Um, Whereas, you know, like a regression approach might, you know, a regression model might give you different answers depending on the scale of the, of the outcome. Okay. Um, of course, you know, this, this is nice properties come at a come at cost. Uh, and the main critiques for, for the randomization tests are that usually they kind of test strong and uninteresting nodes, uh, like the global node, right? It's kind of telling you that, that nothing is happening. So which is pretty strong. Like we do expect something is happening. Uh, and the other is that it cannot generalize out of samples. So if you would like to ask many kind of more subtle, more detailed questions, then 
uh, they, you have to really change the randomization test, which is actually what we're going to do. Like we're going to, to, to test something that's a little more complex and we'll, you see that the, 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 the test kind of breaks down uh, pretty easily. Um, so it's kind of a matter of philosophy, like, like whether what, what kind of a method you prefer. Um, we, in, in this paper, we do prefer, in our work, usually we do prefer the randomization test because just because even though it kind of tests a simple, maybe perhaps strong null hypothesis, it, the fact that it kind of answers this correctly and precisely and you know, honestly in some sense, uh, that, that's a big plus. Okay, so that said, the question is, okay, we are able to, to test the simple hypothesis like the global null, how about so far, right? Like how about, can we test the no interference assumption uh, with this Fisarian test? And the surprise, surprising answer is no, right? Like if you suppose you want to tr try to test this sort of assumption where the outcomes are the same when your individual treatment is the same, uh, we can easily see that the FRT kind of runs into trouble. Um, so how can we see this? Well, it's a very simple logical argument. Look at this null hypothesis, right? In order to be able to use it in a randomization test, the way we did it in the, in the global null, uh, we have to fix the individual treatment of the unit, right? So suppose you have a unit that's treated in the experiment and you kind of do the randomization test. Now, if you set this unit to control, the null hypothesis is not sharp enough to tell you what the outcome of that unit will be, right? Because you only observe the, the, the outcome of the unit when the, that unit is, is treated. So in the randomization test, you have to keep that unit in treatment. And now, because you have to do this for every unit I, this immediately implies that in the randomization test, this Z star has to be equal to Z out. So basically the randomization distribution is degenerate. You cannot, you cannot test the, the null distribution because uh, the null hypothesis, sorry, because the support of the randomization distribution is just a singleton, only contains z -ops. okay? In other words, this, this null is not sharp enough, right? But, um, and that introduces constraints on how I should do my randomization test, how I should run my randomization test. And in this case, if I'm going to use all the units, then I can just not run it because I only have one assignment where everyone is fixed, the observed assignment. Everyone is, is fixed at the observed at its observed individual treatment, which is the observed uh, vector. Okay, so even in this very simple case, um, the Fisher randomization test cannot be cannot be run, cannot be executed. So we need to do something something else. Okay, um, and this is the idea now uh, that has emerged like recently that this realization that the problem is coming from the the, the specific null that we're trying to test but it is also related to, the, to our decision to use all the units, right? Remember this constraint, like we had this constraint for a unit I, and then we took this constraint for all the units. That's how we, we call it, that's, how, that's why we call it the randomization test. Now the idea is that maybe I don't have to run it on one unit, I run it on a subset of units, okay? And to illustrate this for, for an example, suppose the design is a Bernoulli, right? What you can do, let's say pick half of the units at random. And let's call them uh, focal units, which is the, the what uh, the AC uh, et al. kind of used as as, as terminology. Um, kind of tells you that you're you're focusing the randomization test in this particular subset of the unit. Let's say let's take a half um, uh, random half, and then we have a test statistic, uh, and make sure that this test statistic we only use uh, the outcome from uh, these focal units. So if this test statistic was a difference in means, we only take the difference in means for the focal units. Um, and then after we've done this, then we run the Fisher randomization test where we only shuffle the treatments of units that are not focals, like the non-focal units. So we kind of fix the, the treatment uh, status for, for, the, for the focal units and then kind of shuffle everybody else, okay? Now this works. Why? Because the support does contain many assignments, right? Like Define this function where uh, we fix the, 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 the treatment assignment uh, of, of, of every focal unit to whatever, to, to its observed status. Um, now this is the, kind of this built entire set which kind of forms the support of our randomization test. Okay. Now, uh, using this notation, you can see why the unconditional, the classical FRT was, was, uh, was we, could not, we could not run, right? We could not, could, 
could not work is because if you plug in here the entire set of, of units, then you only get a single done um, uh, set. Okay. Uh, and that's the basic idea behind conditional randomization tests, uh, which you know recently has been uh, used in order to run, like extend, um, apply the feature randomization test in this interference setting. Okay. And uh, deal address these uh, challenges, these constraints that come from like non-sharp uh, null null hypothesis. Now, obviously, the question is: Okay, this was an example. Of what happens with other designs, or why why take half? Why not take the quarter? Or like um, uh, why why not kind of define it in a in a in some kind of optimal way? And all these are valid questions. So. Let's, let's start, start building up from this very simple idea. And the first generalization we're going to make is we're going to generalize the, the, the feature test that I, that I described earlier into a conditional feature randomization test, okay? So uh, I'm mostly following the, the structure of the classical randomization test. Uh, the only thing that changes is that now we're going to condition on a subset of units and a subset of assignments. The, the pair of these two, we're going to use the notation C, and this is going to be the conditioning event, as we say. We're going to condition uh, the test in this pair of units and assignments. Uh, this is going to have a distribution. So basically it's, and it's, up to the, it's going to be up to the analyst to decide what this, this distribution is going to be in the same way that it was up to us to decide whether we're going to treat half of the units or like quarter of the units uh, in, the, in the previous, previous example. Now, take a test statistic that's only defined in this uh, C pair. Basically, we're using outcomes from units in, in, in U, and we make sure that we can impute outcomes in this script Z set. Then our test is exactly as a Fisherian test, but we have one first step at the beginning where we first sample the conditioning and then run the randomization test. Okay, so we condition the test on this pair of units and this, uh, on, on this pair of set of units and set of assignments, okay? Um, now, and if you, how we do this randomization test, uh, how we kind of sample it uh, is going to be, uh, uh, we, we're going to discuss like what is the proper selection for that randomization, like this sampling distribution. Now, um, we call this, uh, this was uh, in our earlier paper uh, with uh, Guillaume and, uh, and Avi, we call this the conditioning mechanism and mechanism just to, to emphasize that this is at the control of the, of the analyst. Uh, and there can be many ways that you can condition this test, okay? Now, the question is, when is this test valid? Well, the, it's a very simple law of probability that the test is valid when you choose uh, resampling distribution here that matches the actual condition distribution given uh, whatever you condition on. Okay, uh, and by this Bayes theorem, this is comprised by your conditioning mechanism and your design. So basically, this is saying the following: uh, you can you can choose your conditioning mechanism however you like. Just make sure that uh, whenever when you run your your randomization test, you kind of randomize, you kind of resample your assignments according to the correct condition distribution. Okay. That is the uh, that is aligned with the conditioning mechanism and the design combination of this theory. Uh, and the probability is again straightforward. Like you can see that uh, I, if I start with with uh, with this test statistic here, then because I condition on C and I, under the null hypothesis, I can just again do the same trick as before. I, instead of Y OPS, I, I can use Y star, right? Because I can impute all the outcomes for the for for this uh, conditioning event. And then uh, again, because I'm using the correct condition distribution here, this has the same distribution as whatever was observed. Okay, so the the that 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 kind of proof now has been uh, the structure of this proof has been has been fixed has been established again. So the the key here, therefore, in this in these approaches is is basically the conditioning mechanism. The moment you have decided how you're going to condition the test. Um, the everything else is is in some sense mechanical, right? So the question is then how to construct one. Like um, um, different mechanisms are going to have uh, different power, right? Like if you don't choose it correctly, it might lead you to empty tests, for instance. Um, Athe et al. In there, uh, they have this very nice paper that kind of explain the uh, a lot of like hypotheses and can explain. Um, they kind of set up different ways to. Uh, uh, to do this kind of conditioning. They, they condition a class of uh, 
conditioning mechanisms where you can split this sampling, uh, where you first sample the units and then you calculate whatever assignments are kind of, uh, uh, whatever assignments you can impute the outcomes for uh, the focal units. Uh, so the all of the so basically their 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 conditioning mechanism space is parameterized by this distribution, uh, and they discuss many uh, nice ways of doing this. Kind of starting from like run, kind of randomly sampling the units as focals, uh, to kind of define defining some the so-called epsilon nets, where if you if you have some idea about how the units are kind of interfering with each other, you might start with like one space uh, and then kind of move. Uh, around the um, around that that space and kind of making sure that there is some some kind of some sort of distance between this 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 uh, this focal units that you are sampling, uh, so that they're not interfering too much. Now the this 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 is a nice approach kind of works in all cases, but it may lead to loss of power. It's not guaranteed that this is going to give you a a, a powerful test, right? It might even be empty if that set is 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 uh, doesn't have too many too many assignments. And also uh, what we're losing, and that's, that's generally a problem of, in, of testing with interference, is we're losing the invariances, like the extensibilities. And so we cannot, it doesn't immediately imply that we can do a permutation test. So in, remember in the Bernoulli example, we could permute things. Uh, when, when we do a conditioning, uh, it's, not lo it's no longer true that the test is necessarily, uh, can, be, can be done by permutations. So in practice it has to be like, in, in, in general, what I, what I had here, it has to be implemented as a kind of a sam sampling um, in, a, in a constraint space, uh, like a weighted sampling, let's say, but that's not, it's not necessarily permutation testing. Now, in, uh, in, our, in our previous work, we, we kind of set up a very specific conditioning mechanism where we made sure that it was extensible with respect to the focal units. And we did that trick in order to be able to run a permutation test. Now, so that was good because the permutation tests are much easier to, to implement and have good power properties. But the downside is that our approach was not general. Like it was only specific to that particular um, interference structure which was a cluster interference and that particular uh, experimental design. So it's an interesting situation here where we have methods that are general, but they're not guaranteed to work well. Uh, and uh, other methods that are kind of work well are permutation tests and easy, but they're not general, right? And so the question is, can we do something more? Uh, which leads me to, to our, own, our own proposal, which is to um, define um, um, an algorithmic way, an automated way to, to produce these conditional mechanisms. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you have yeah. around eight minutes, uh, eight to 10 minutes left. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll try to to rush it. Uh, thankfully, there are a lot of uh, kind of pictures coming up. Uh, so let me kind of go back to the Medigan example, kind of illustrate to you the uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the the kind of challenges we have in this in this case. So in the Medigan example, let's suppose we define three different exposures. Uh, one is you're kind of you're receiving short range spillovers if you are in control, and then you have a uh, a treated unit that's kind of close to you. Um, and then this, uh, I'm going, not doing, going to talk about these thresholds now, but we can, we can accommodate other thresholds. This was um, uh, defined by kind of co collaborators of ours that are kind of criminologists and sociologists and they can work in this, in this, in this area. Uh, I want to focus mostly on the method as I can also uh, uh, suggested earlier. Uh, now, suppose we have a pure control exposure where you are in control and the, the closest that's, uh, the uh, street that is treated is kind of 500 meters away from you, it's kind of far away. And then there's another exposure level that's neither. We don't care about uh, the other exposure level. So we're going to focus only on these two uh, exposures, right? So basically we're going to test a hypothesis where uh, we're going to say that your outcomes are the same um, uh, regard, re, either when you receive uh, sword trains or, or your true control. So there's no differential effect between these two exposures. So what is a conditioning mechanism? So this is again the, the Medellin, uh, the city of Medellin. Well, there's not clear how, what kind of units to condition on, right? Like for this particular hypothesis. Uh, there's a fairly non fairly non-uniform uh, kind of picture here, like kind of interference, the special interference uh, is kind of continuous. Uh, there are these gaps here. So it's entirely not clear how, how you're going to do the conditioning. Um, which leads me to, to, to this idea, which is the main, let's say, contribution, 
conceptual contribution, if you will, uh, of, of our work, which is the null exposure graph. So the way we decide the conditioning is the following. So on the left side, we put units. On the right side, we put assignments. And kind of enumerate all the units, enumerate all the assignments. And then we're going to connect a unit to an assignment. Um, if um, uh, that unit and that assignment are exposed to either the short range, this unit is exposed to either short range spillovers or is in pure control under that particular assignment. Uh, and we can do this because this relationship is deterministic, right? We can, we can look into unit one, we can look into assignment one, and we can say that is that unit receiving short range spillovers or long, long or, or is it in pure control under this particular assignment? Um, and by the way, this, this, this one here kind of means the, the entire population assignment. So I'm kind of use this this dot to represent this, this thing. Now we can do this for all possible um, um, all possible pairs and then the outcome of this, the product of this is the so-called null exposure graph. Now why is this useful is because uh, now we can look into specific structures in this graph and especially a biclick. A biclick is basically a subset of units and a subset of assignments for which all of the units are connected to all of the assignments. Why is this useful? Because if ZOBS, if the observed assignment is in that click, in this by click, then basically we, we can run an anonymization test within this by click. Okay? And that's, the, let's say, the key insight of, of our approach is that it's kind of to translate the, the conditioning you have to do an anonymization test into a graph operation, like into trying to find the click in this null exposure graph. Okay. And if you find a click, then you can run the randomization test within this click. Um, so essentially, the, the kind of conditioning mechanism we, we propose is pretty simple. The moment where you, you find this click, it's pretty simple. Basically, we're going to say, we're going to condition the click that contains ZOPs. Okay. So here is the, the map of Medellin. This is the observed assignments. Uh, these are the units that are exposed to short range spillovers from the treated units. As you can see here, they're close to the treated units. And these are the units here in the navy color that are pure control, right? They're not, they're kind of far away from the treated unit. Uh, and we can keep doing this for all possible assignments. And if you do this, you get a picture like this, where you have units on one, on, on one dimension, assignments on the other, and then every dot here corresponds to the kind of exposure that that unit receives. So again, this light blue is short range, the navy is uh, pure control, and this white is the neither, okay? And because in my null hypothesis, I only want to focus on the sh on the short and the and the um, on the navy on the on the navy and the light blue colors, I uh, the the click that I'm going to condition on is going to look like this. It's it's comprised of these two colors, okay. And the more noise there is here, the, the better it is because it's going to give me more let's say support and more variation in my test, which translates into power. But uh, we might might have a little more time to discuss that. Okay, so to summarize what we do is given a null hypothesis, given exposures, we create this null exposure graph, in this, this created in a deterministic way. Uh, and then basically we're going to find a click and then we're going to condition the randomization test in this click. So the question is, how do you choose this click? What, which way can you condition, uh, what, what way you can condition on sets that um, uh, you, we give you a valid test? Uh, here I have an example that I don't have time to get into. Kind of shows you that um, some I some some ideas that look straight uh, kind of intuitive do not work. Like if you try to find the maximal click that contains ZOBS, does not work. Uh, it does not lead to a valid test, and the proof is is pretty uh, pretty simple. Uh, just to sh kind of, kind of shows you that uh, greediness is being punished in the when you when you when you do a randomization test. Uh, it's it's better to, to uh, kind of uh, respect the invariances and the, 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 um, the, the symmetries in your design rather than kind of strive for, for optimality. Um, so what, what we end up doing is to first, given the null exposure graph, we make a by-click decomposition. So we use a graph algorithm, kind of splits this graph into clicks, and then we look, we condition the click that contains the obs. And then we run the conditional randomization test. And that's valid. Um, the proof is straightforward because the moment you do that, you can see that uh, we, we can kind of follow the exact same proof technique that I, I, I kind of showed you earlier, like the proof sketch, uh, where the conditional randomization uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the test is um, 
the condition normalization given this click that we condition on is actually the same as the normalization distribution. And so um, this gives us validity. Uh, the important thing here is that step where, uh, since we have this null exposure graph that's fixed, uh, we created the composition that's also fixed, right? It doesn't depend on, on the observed assignment. So this first step can happen without even, even before running the experiment. Okay? So we have this decomposition and then you run the experiment and then you see what, is, uh, what kind of click does the observed assignment kind of fall in and then you run the conditional organization. And this is guaranteed to be valid. Um, a few things about uh, this computation, this by click decomposition is, is, is hard, is NP hard. Um, uh, we do use an, uh, an, an R package to do this for us. It works fine for a, a number of uh, nodes and, and edges. Uh, however, we don't have to use them, uh, like um, we, we don't have to have like maximal clicks, right? We don't have to, um, we, only, you know, we only need just one decomposition, right? Like the bigger these clicks are usually, the, the, the more powerful they are. And I have a result for, for that if we have time to discuss it, but uh, in order for the method to be valid, any kind of decomposition works. Any click decomposition is going to work. Um, I have some results about power, but in the interest of time, I can I can uh, I can skip it. If there are questions, I will be happy to take them. I can describe it on a very high level uh, that we can um, derive the power of this test as a function of the number of units and the number of assignments in the click. So I can take the, the click size and I can see how this affects the power of the test. Uh, the interesting thing here is that the, the these two different sides of the click affect the power of the test in fundamentally different ways, which is quite interesting. Um, and uh, if there are questions, I will be, I will be happy to, to take them uh, later. Uh, and a few final words about what happened in the Medellin experiment. We had there 37,000 units with the streets. Uh, the design was uniformly random from 10,000 assignments that were pre-computed by the, the scientists. Uh, the, the, the null exposure graph had about uh, 160 million edges and then the density was about 44%. Uh, we ended up conditioning click that's, that has 4,000 units almost and then 1,000 uh, units assignments, 1,000 uh, uh, assignments in a click. Um, so these are the two, the two, the two sides, which are given our power calculation, the power calculation that I showed you earlier, there's a pretty big uh, size for the click. So we do expect to have a, a high power uh, under the assumptions of, of that theorem, of course. Uh, and here's how the conditioning looks like. Uh, remember when I, kind of earlier when I said, look, this is the city of Medellin, how do I do the conditioning? This, this, algorithm, this algorithm that I presented to you, this click-based randomization test, actually figures out these focals uh, for us. Okay, so before we said, okay, what are the units I have to condition on? Um, the pattern is, uh, the, the, the algorithm is immediately finds what the, the pattern has to be. So you see that the focal units are around in the outskirts, probably for the pure controls, and then some units in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the center, in the downtown, uh, for those that receive uh, the speed loaders. Um, and the, the bottom line here for this picture is that, I guess the, the key uh, remark here is that, uh, we won't be able to reproduce this pattern if we just, let's say, we randomly sample the focals, right? Like, this is a very specific pattern uh, in the sense that it's very specific to the particular experimental design and the, the particular structure of interference and the particular hypothesis where we are testing. Uh, so the, I, I think the, the great benefit, the big benefit of our approach is that given all these three different factors, it's going to automatically, in some way, in some sense, find you uh, what are the, the focals that you have to condition on, okay? Of course, there are, there's a price to be paid by, by, by being very general, namely power, but uh, again, if there are questions about power, I will be happy to, to, to discuss. And here's what the remuneration distribution looks like. Our p-value was, was not significant, like 0.07, significant at the 10% level, not significant at the 5% at the, at the level. Uh, so there are definitely some spillovers at play, but um, uh, don't have to be, uh, they're not strong at the 5% level. And we, we could do this for other definition of hypothesis, other, defini other definitions of the distance, what, what, what we mean by, by short spillovers, what we mean by pure control. Um, our algorithm can be adjusted and then can, can be run again to, to test any kind of uh, such hypothesis. 
So to summarize uh, what we did is, first of all, we put some structure and all these different null hypotheses uh, under interference, and there are many of them in the interference literature. Uh, this concept of exposure functions, functions is useful to um, kind of have some kind of compact language to, 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 def to describe this null hypothesis. Uh, I presented to you a new method for testing um, um, null hypothesis of interference uh where um the, the 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 kind of hypothesis is 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 arbitrary the, the the structure of the hypothesis is arbitrary and also the um uh the, the experiment the experimental design is also arbitrary so the method is, is general and it can basically proceed by building this null exposure graph for this particular problem that you have in hand and then finds it kind of splits this graph in by clicks and then conditions the randomization test in, in a by click so basically it takes a statistical problem and and translates it into some group of, uh, sorry, so some graph operations, uh, which has also in, you know, a kind of an interesting, uh, let's say, interaction uh, between uh, computation, let's say graph, uh, graph computations and, and statistics. Um, and future work, of course, is kind of get more insights about power and then how, uh, think about how we can leverage the, the design, right? Like how can we, um, because the, this, the, this click, Based test that I described to you, you didn't use the, the design anywhere, right? So the question is, how could I leverage the, the design, uh, knowledge of the design so that I can have more powerful, um, uh, like better, like more powerful uh, randomization tests? And with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I will be happy to take any questions. Looking forward to, to, to Kong's discussion as well. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Panos, for the great talk. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should very quickly now move on to the discussion. Uh, yeah, as said, uh, Pang will discuss uh, the talk. After that, Panos will, uh, will be able to respond. So I'm switching over now to Pang. Oh, can I share my screen now? Looks good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Panas, for your uh, presentation for a wonderful idea. My only critique is you used all the time. I don't have time to discuss. OK. It's really interesting topic. Uh, I will comment on um, uh, more basic aspects of randomization tests for non-sharp null hypothesis. Uh, I, I, I thought about this topic during the weekend. I, I came up with uh, six uh, general strategies from the literature. Uh, let's start with the uh, uh, Fisher's lady testing T experiment. So the lady testing T experiment is interesting because uh, let me review it. So Bristol claimed uh, at Rossum state he could tell the difference between uh, milk tea or tea milk order, and the experimenter randomly present eight cups of tea, four with milk added first, and four with tea added first. So the experimenter want to test whether Bristol can tell the difference of the order. And after the experiment, Bristol was correct for all eight cups of tea, and Fisher reported a p-value, one over eight to uh, four. So the p-value is 0 0.01, smaller than 0 0.5. Basically, uh, he rejected the null hypothesis that Bristol couldn't tell the difference. It's a very famous example, but it's a very non-trivial example for me. For example, we can ask the following questions. Where does this p-value come from? What, what is the null hypothesis? Or do, do we even have RID sampling in this case? The lady tested for eight times. All the observations are correlated. And it's an example of interference. And if we think those observations are correlated, they only have one data point, how do we make statistical inference? Seems hopeless. But Fisher made it possible by defining the null hypothesis in the following way. So if we define the treatment uh, as Z, the vector Z1 to Z8, with one, the coordinate being one corresponding to milk T, order milk T, and we define the potential outcomes YIZ for trial I. And for each trial I, there, there are eight choose four or 70 possible uh, treatments. The treatment is the treatment vector. And how, how do we test hypothesis? And the Fisher's choice of the null, which is called the sharp null, is yiz, does not depend on z at all. So for each trial i, 
the potential outcome has nothing to do with the treatment sequence. Under this Sharpner hypothesis, the observed outcomes are all fixed. The only randomness is this z vector, 70 possible values. And because Bristol was correct, for all the trial, then the only, the, there is only one configuration with probability of 1 over 70. That's why Fisher reported p value 0.01. And in this simple but non trivial example, we can see FRT, Fisher randomization test, works automatically for a sharp knot, even with interference. So the fundamental difficulty for FRT is not really interference, it's really a non sharp knot hypothesis. But of course, the interference problem can make the non sharp knot testing more challenging. That's the topic of Pana's talk. How can we test non sharp knot hypothesis with FRTs? There are six general strategies. First, we can view all the missing potential outcomes as nuisance parameters. If we know those nuisance parameters, we can compute the p-value because we know the exact distribution as a function of y means. Then by definition of classical p-value, the final p-value for non sharp hypothesis is the maximum p-value over all possible value of nuisance. But unfortunately, this is uh, too difficult for computation, this maximization problem. And each p-value is from FRT. Sometimes people are crazy. So for binary outcome in treatment control experiment, we can do this because we can enumerate all possible values of potential outcomes because it's binary. And, and uh, Rigdon and Hadrian and uh, Lee and then, uh, discussed this uh, issue. The second strategy is the burger boost uh, strategy. We don't want to ma take maximum, ma maximum value over all possible value of y means. If sometimes a nuisance parameter, eta can determine the unknown uh, missing potential outcomes, we can use the following two-step procedure. First, construct confidence region for this nuisance parameter. Then the final p-value is this maximum p-value over this confidence region plus this correction, because we, there's a kind of multiple testing issue. In the first step, we, we, we lose something. And this burger boost strategy is quite uh, useful in classical statistics and also useful in causal inference. For example, Nolan and Hadrian use it for principal stratification and, and uh, we use it for testing whether the treatment effect is constant, allowing for an unknown parameter tau. The third strategy uh, is, is clo close to Pana's discussion, it's conditional randomization test, but it's much simpler. Let's focus on this simple case of completely randomized experiment, treatment control. There is a binary covariate X. We are interested in testing the subgroup null hypothesis, whether there is anything going on for units with covariates being one. It seems obvious to use the following Fisher randomization test. It's a subgroup analysis. We just keep the units with XI equals one and condition on the number of treated units and control units within stratum XI equals one. If the original design is completely randomized, the condition, conditioning on units uh, within stratum one, we, we also have a completely randomized experiment. So we can apply FRT straightforwardly. But if the original, the base experiment is more complex, we, we can uh, claim conditioning on x one equals, x i equals one, we have a simple experiment. It's much more complicated. We have to use rejective sampling. And the second a version of the conditional FRT is even closer to Bana's talk. We consider a completely randomized experiment with multiple treatment levels, more than two. We have uh, several, we have GA potential outcomes. But the, what if we are only interested in testing the null hypothesis at y0 equals y1 for all unit i? There's no statement about other treatment levels. In this case, it's also intuitive. But we just keep all the units with the observed treatment being zero or one, and we condition the i being zero or one, we still have a completely randomized experiment if the original experiment is simple. And we can apply standard Fisher randomization test. But, but unfortunately, if the base experiment is more complex, we cannot easily derive the conditional distribution of z. And with network interference, uh, 
Pana's uh, idea is to use the null exposure graph to select a subset of the units and a subset of the treatment such that the null hypothesis is sharp, such that we can compute the null distribution of an test statistic. This is strategy three. And for uh, strategy four, we have to use uh, some tactics. Facial randomization tests are always valid under the sharp now, but sometimes if we use uh, a, an appropriate test statistic, for example, a student test statistic, or syntactically they're also valid for average now. The simple example is from Cho and Romano. If we are interested in testing whether the means are the same in treatment and control, we can use permutation test with the uh, T statistic or the Brown's Fisher statistic. Importantly, the difference in, difference in means still don't test by the standard error. And we extended to a uh, general factorial experiment under the finite population formulation. Trying the Romana is slightly different from Pana's formulation, all the potential outcomes are fixed. There, they still assume ID sampling, but we can easily modify the mathematics to make it work. And, and, and Guillaume and Avi uh, have already derived a syntactics for the Panas example one is in the original paper. It's the two stage experiment. They already derived the syntactics. And I think using the student test strategy, we can just pretend that the null hypothesis is sharp and it works uh, for this, uh, for weak null hypothesis, even weaker null hypothesis, because we, we just test the average is the same for two exposure level. And, and I don't know whether anybody has done the asymptotic theory for spatial interference, the second example in Pana's paper. If we can do the asymptotic theory, we can use the student test strategy for testing uh, the weak now. And at least it's asymptotically valid. Uh, the fifth uh, uh, strategy is more subtle. Orig initially, facial randomization test was designed for testing the sharp now, but, but we can claim it always works for some non-sharp null hypothesis. But of course, we have to be very uh, careful. We have to work hard to find those non-sharp null hypothesis. And hopefully, they are still of interest. For example, Rosenbaum and Choi um, use this idea to, Rosenbaum was for two by two table, Choi was for interference. Under monotonicity, we can use uh, FRT or you can invert a sequence of FRT to construct confidence interval for attributable effect. And the attributable effect is closely related to treatment effect on the treated. And the Rosenbaum has other papers of inverting FRT without the sharp knot using this, uh, using rank statistics. What, what do they mean if we uh, insist using FRT? And the final strategy is the combination of uh, a Bayesian perspective and the frequentist perspective. So we already uh, discussed if we treat the missing potential outcomes as nuisance uh, parameters, if they are known, we can compute the p-value, exact p-value. But if they are unknown, we do not want to take the, ma take the maximum over all possible values because that's too conservative. And some values are not plausible based on the data. So for Bayesian, not all I means uh, of the same probability. So if we impose a stochastic model and prior, we can compute the posterior distribution of the missing potential outcomes given the data. So the Bayesian p-value is, uh, is the average p-value over the posterior distribution, which is called the posterior predictive p-value. And, and Rubin and other people have already applied this idea to causal inference. But unfortunately, this p-value often annoys uh, both frequentists and, and Bayesian, although it's a combination of both. This, this part is frequentist, this part is Bayes. The combination of frequentist and Bayes uh, yields a, a procedure that's not frequentist or Bayesian. You can, you can, you can show in general this p-value has no frequency uh, property. But, but it's a different uh, way of thinking. We have to change the inferential paradigm to deal with nuisance parameters. Okay. This is my review of uh, six uh, general strategies. I think, I, th I think a lot of, the, of those strategies can be applied to the interference problem discussed by panels. But we have to 
different strategy has uh, different uh, pros and cons. Uh, for example, the last one, we have to believe our stochastic model. Thank you, Panos, for this inspiring presentation. Uh, thanks, Pang. Uh, we're running very low on time, but perhaps, Panos, do you want to quickly uh, respond to uh, Pang's discussion? Yeah, uh, very quickly. Uh, thanks, Pong. This is extremely informative, like summary of like different approaches, and I definitely agree. Like all of them can be can be. Hello, did you hear me, or did, was I talking to myself? No, we hear you. All good. Okay, all right. Um, yes, so all of them are like valid, and we 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 are exploring in some other work like other other approaches. Um, uh, in for instance, the the Berger approach. Uh, my uh, my my only I guess. Um, uh, let's say a pushback will be in, in situations where you have the design. Um, I will still, still, since we have the design and we can have an exact test, I will still prefer the exact test, even though it kind of goes through uh, some kind of painful conditioning, some painful loss of information uh, uh, compared to trusting like an asymptotic p-value. But, you know, that's, I understand that that's more like a, like a preference, but um, Yeah, but uh, overall, yes, this is um, very useful and very valid points. All right, uh, great, thanks. So I think we are running out of time. So I think we should uh, wrap up. So uh, first of all, thank you very much, Panos, for like uh, giving a talk about this beautiful idea. Thanks, Pang, for, uh, for a great discussion. Uh, next Tuesday, we have Judith Locke from Boston University talk about causal organic indirect and direct effects closer to Barron and Kenny with a product method for uh, binary mediators. And uh, also we have a discussion with Kozuke. Um, we're all very looking, very much looking forward to that talk until we hope that you all stay safe uh, and enjoy the summer. Uh, have a nice week. Thanks for joining and uh, see you next time.